All right, welcome back. This is the continuation of our discussion of the works of Ludwig Wittgenstein. So we've been talking about Wittgenstein in our class Essex Philosophy. In the previous recording, we talked about some of the main claims um, made by Wittgenstein in his early work, the Tractatus. In this class, in this recording, we're going to turn to his mature work, his later work, it's called The Philosophical Investigations. So I, I already suggested this in passing towards the end of the last recording. This work of Wittgenstein, The Philosophical Investigations, makes uh, quite a departure from the Tractatus. Uh, for one, The Philosophical Investigations is more descriptive. As you can see here from this quotation, so um, PI means philosophical investigations. You might see this appear on the other slides. So whenever you see that, that means uh, we're talking about a, an excerpt from that book. So for instance, Wittgenstein says, philosophy may in no way interfere with the actual use of language, it can in the end only describe it. It leaves everything as it is. So as you can see, contrast that to the Tractatus, the Tractatus say, uh, which says, you know, language, ordinary language is messy. There's so much ambiguity. There's so, so much room for misinterpretation. So the best thing to do is to reduce our languages to their essence, to a single fixed essence of language. But the philosophical investigations does not agree. So you can see that the later Wittgenstein is anti-essentialist. First, um, there is definitely a recognition of the plurality of languages. So there isn't a single language and there isn't a, you know, a single fixed unchanging essence of language. But uh, Wittgenstein talks about language games. Why? Uh, first of all, as you can see, games in the plural. There's a plurality of languages, language games, because they have their own rules, and you use them according to the rules of each language. And also, because they, they share certain similarities, the way games, you know, overlap in terms of mechanics, in terms of rules, in terms of number of, of people playing, in terms of uh, the kind of entertainment that they, they provide, etc. So this is clearly against uh, the more essentialist position of the early Wittgenstein. You have here a couple of uh, quotations from uh, the philosophical investigations. You know, he calls these language games. And, you know, even a primitive language is a language game because it follows certain rules. And also here in this text here at the bottom, he already suggests that there is a very close link between languages and actions or activities of people. We'll come back to that in a minute. Now, secondly, Wittgenstein speaks of, uh, he talks about meaning, but in a different way. So in the philosophical investigations, he no longer talks about meaning in terms of the correspondence theory. What is the correspondence theory? That means that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between a name and an object. So meaning is basically a reference. So when I say this, the meaning of this is that to which it refers. So for instance, if I'm, uh, if I say this, if I click on this, this, this is what I mean, this, this sign, okay? So that's what I mean by this. That's a one-to-one -one correspondence. But then if you limit um, the meaning of meaning to this, you run into all sorts of problems. So for just to give you an example, Imagine a teacher, a Mrs. So-and-so. So to her students, she's Mrs. So-and-so. That's what they call her. 
but the teacher's children they don't call her mrs so and so they call her mom i suppose mom mama mommy and another term another word is used or another name is used by her colleagues maybe she's called karen and then another name by her friends by her close friends so you can see the the point here is that you can be referring to a one and the same object but there could be different ways of referring to that same object so you know meaning is not necessarily reducible to the correspondence of name and object that's just one example there are many other uh, possible ways of of uh, demonstrating this so in the later the later Wittgenstein talks about uh, another meaning of meaning he says for a large number of cases though not for all in which we employ the word meaning it can be defined thus and even here he's already careful he's saying for for the most part but probably not for all cases he says the meaning of a word is its use in the language so if you're looking at words their their meanings are contingent upon dependent upon how they are used in a language so this is this can easily be illustrated just think of you know particular words particular words that might i mean in terms of spelling in terms of their spelled in terms of how the letter the letters are combined they can be you know the the, the so-called very same words can have different meanings in different languages just to give you an example for instance you can, you can go to this website Reader's Digest Canada, and it gives you a list of English that mean uh, some things in other languages to talk about. That gift, gift in, in Dutch, for instance, means the same configuration, the same combination of letters. But that can mean in Germanic language, just poison, for instance. So that's just an example to show you that the meaning of a word is its use. The meaning of a particular sign a particular combination of letters is determined by how it's used by language users of a particular language i mean users of a particular language okay what other things can we point out i mean given this point of view of uh the mature Wittgenstein. So there's no one-to-one -one correspondence. I mean, meaning is not the one-to-one -one correspondence of names and objects. Uh, we we can also understand that you know words do not have uh, a single. You know, a particular word doesn't have a single fixed, unchanging meaning. Actually, the meaning of words or the meanings of of a particular word they overlap okay they the one word can have different meanings and these different meanings can overlap they can crisscross and Wittgenstein says they can form a kind of family resemblance you know for instance look look for look up these words in the dictionary play or game that's why I have all of these word art uh figures here just look up the word game in the dictionary and you will see so many definitions of game or play play can mean you know playing a game or it can be a, a theatrical performance um you know people talk about the state of play or force different forces that are at play that are active that that uh, that have influence or power in a particular situation so you can see that the the meanings of words are not always clear cut okay the same goes for game game can refer to you know think of a game it can be a board game can be a video game it can be 
a basketball game, a football game. Some of these games have similarities. Some use balls. Some, uh, some have ten players, twelve players. You know, some are played on boards, etc. So words have different meanings that overlap. You know, the same, uh, a similar thing can be said about languages. Just as words of families of meanings, so languages also overlap and they also intersect. There isn't a single language that we all use. Even if, for instance, you, all of you speak English, but I suppose, you know, the way you speak English in the classroom is slightly different from the way you speak English, let's say, at home. And probably for some of you, you know, your home language is different from your school language, you know, and the language you use among friends is definitely different from the language that you use in a paper when you're writing a paper. Now. To the question, is there a single essence of all languages? Obviously, the later Wittgenstein's answer is no. There are multiple languages. In addition to that, all of these, you know, these different languages, they are connected to a form of life. So they are somehow connected to some kind of human activity. So language is not something that's, a, that, you know, it's wrong to think of language in essentialist terms that as though it language for something abstract something that was you know detached from the world detached from human activity no if one is to imagine a language the later Wittgenstein tells us then one that means one has to imagine a form of life human activities you know human actions human decisions There is a multiplicity of languages, and the number of languages is not fixed once and for all. And the meaning of our words, the way we use language, and the number of language games that we can engage in, that we can use, those things are not fixed. They can grow. They can, some will die out, some will disappear, some will evolve, others will become more dominant, etc. So way of looking at languages is to understand it as a kind of old city. An old city has different neighborhoods, different districts, you know, different inhabitants with, you know, all these people having different backgrounds, some parts of the city older than others, you know. So languages are like that. And lastly, just, just to hammer home the point, right? just as, you know, there are different, you can imagine, try to imagine languages as constituting this sprawling city with different sections, different neighborhoods, okay? You can also imagine at the same time that there are different activities happening in those languages. So... We're talking about multiplicity here. We're, we're talking about uh, languages that are closely connected to ways of life. So imagine, what does it mean? How can we, in terms of Wittgenstein's later philosophy, how can we then understand the human being? If we could extract an answer to the question, who are you, who am I, from the, the point of view of the later Wittgenstein? What do you think, you know, an answer, your answer could be? How would you answer that question? Okay. So I hope that was clear. I'll see you in the next class. And I hope you get to think about, uh, to reflect on the questions that we post in this class. Okay, goodbye.